Hello everybody, welcome back for another video lecture for Critical Reasoning Online. Um, this is the part three video for the module Building Blocks of Arguments. And as we were talking about last time, we have some more um, things to annotate that we want to be watching for. Um, and the one, the big ones we're going to talk about here, let, we'll see how far we can get here with just talking about assuring, guarding, and discounting. These are three other uh, activities that we um, use as a part of the broader activity of arguing and again we're playing this game where we want to try to be able to spot these things when they're happening and my advice is always to uh, have a good deep understanding of what is the phenomenon that we're listening for so be listening for this thing happening and then go looking for the words that are responsible rather than um, thinking about it more mechanically where you're just memorizing maybe a list of words that do this sort of work. There are some common words and phrases that do assuring, guarding, and discounting. That's true, um, but uh, they there's always some stranger cases or idiosyncratic cases, and it's better to know the pattern that you're looking for than the particular examples and, and be stuck just with that. So that you'll be able to detect any non-standard cases when they happen. Um, and again, ultimately, the goal that we're shooting for here is to be able to um, spot these things in a block of argumentative prose, whether that's spoken or whether it's written. Um, and we'll use those uh, kind of a preparation for what we'll be doing in the next module as kind of like a set of landmarks that then we'll draw a more complete map out of later. But they're going to be really helpful for setting us up to do that. And if we get through assuring, guarding, and discounting with enough time, then I'll try to get into the last little bit of uh, the material we've got for this section in this video. Um, we'll see how, how efficiently I, I, my lecture goes. And that would be evaluative terms. So that's all um, kind of as, in a grand scheme of things here. Um, the main activity that we're really focusing on this in this module is being able to annotate these moves and we really have a very short list of things that we're annotating for. We want to um, annotate for argument markers, conclusion and premise markers. So we'll be able to spot those when those are happening. Um, assuring, guarding, discounting, and evaluative, posit a positive evaluative terms and negative evaluative terms. So really that's just six things that we're on the lookout for. That's it. Um, wait, seven. <laughs> Sorry, seven things that we're on the lookout for uh, on this list, um, and this is something that will be on the exam. This is this is the um, exercise, you, if you will, that you'll be asked to do on the exam. Um, so, <clears throat> getting back into that. Oh, I also, uh, as a bit of a, what, what's going to happen here, I'm going to lecture on the good uses of assuring, guarding, and discounting the inappropriate uses of assuring, guarding, and discounting, and the abusive um, ways that we could use these activities, um, which I'll call the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, but I want to keep in mind here, or I want you to keep in mind early on here that really the only thing that I'm able to um, easily test for on the exam will just be your recognition that this thing is happening. You won't be asked on the exam to evaluate whether it's going in a good way or a bad way, that's, again, the exam can only be so large. <laughs> so I have to pick and choose what we're going to do. And all I'll be asking you to do is to be able to identify it. But you might want to think about this for yourself. And for it, both in terms of when you're the one constructing arguments um, and doing these maneuvers, um, and when you're listening to other people and engaging in debate and that kind of thing. So keep that in mind. Also, one last little caveat. Um, I oftentimes talk about these different um, activities of assuring, guarding, and discounting as like maneuvers or tactics or something in uh, as a part of argue, the activity of arguing and debate. And I will actually continue to use some martial metaphors here um, in order to explain like what kinds of moves in the game they are. But keep in mind, uh, even if we use these martial metaphors, that in a debate or in an argument, um, we're not trying to destroy each other. The, you know, again, back to the code of intellectual conduct. This is co this is a cooperative approach, not an antagonistic combative approach. 
Um, but a lot of times these combat metaphors work really good for arguments because we are throwing ideas at each other and seeing which ones um, hold water and which ones uh, are vulnerable to objections and are, are problematic. So we, we do kind of let our ideas duke it out, but um, the people that are involved are still, you know, ideally seeing this as a cooperative uh, activity working together with their opponent, with their enemy. Um, they're actually on the same side in terms of trying to get at the truth. But the ideas are definitely wage waging a lot of war on each other, so we'll see, and um, you'll see how that kind of plays out with these metaphors. Okay, so let's talk about the first one. Um, assuring. Yeah, again, keep in mind, uh, assuring, guarding, and discounting, like we said last time, are all ways of trying to deal with the regress problem that happens with arguments where in order to defend one argument as good, we have to make another argument to defend its premises, but then that also requires defending the premises of that argument in order for that to succeed, and so on and so forth, and then you get this regress problem. You're like, where did the buck stop? Where do we, you know, what's the final proof of something? Or what is the ultimate evidence? And uh, that may not be possible. Um, but there are ways that we can deal with this. Um, and I, I can say a lot of things about this, actually, but maybe we'll leave it at this. I mean, in, in philosophy, we sort of acknowledge how um, there's limitations to what we could probably do rationally, um, what we could hope to do. Um, and we want to make progress on that even if we can't have minds like God, even if we couldn't see everything and have that final ultimate certainty about truth. Um, we'd like that. That'd be great. If it was possible, cool. But the chances are um, not looking good. If I, you know, as a student of the history of philosophy, um, chances are not good that we are going to be able to um, have that thing that we want. But we can still see it as meaningful to... Um, make progress toward the truth, to having better ideas. Um, and all of these things, assuring, guarding, and discounting, have a proper use to them. They're not just kind of sloughing off the responsibility of tracking down that sort of rabbit hole, that endless regress problem. That usually can always show up. I, mean, it, it's, I, I have seen a lot of people burn out in philosophy, and I think one of the, the reasons why this can be true is that it can be really hard to tolerate this, that there's no, you're, you're putting all this energy and work into something that is never completed, that's never satisfying in terms of its ultimate goals or something like that. But um, I think the people who are able to, um, I don't want to say succeed in philosophy, or at least have, just have patience to do it their whole life, are people who... Uh, do it for the sake of the process, who think that the process is a meaningful and important thing, and we make little incremental improvements um, as we're going. But anyway, assuring, guarding, and discounting will be a part of all this. So uh, you'll see here in my lecture notes that I always start here with a little definition of what it is, um, and then we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly too. Okay, so what's going on with assuring? The phenomenon that we're talking about and the thing to be listening for is this speech act indicating that there are backup reasons even though we are not giving them fully right now. And, and I should clarify, this could be a speech act or a conversational act. You'll see one of the main ways that we can do this is with conversational implication. But the key thing about assuring that makes assuring what it is, is indicating that there are backup reasons even though you're not giving them. And to go to a martial metaphor here, um, this would be kind of like, imagine you know you got two armies lined up on the field of battle and you know there's a terrain involved here and imagine that one of the commanders calls up the enemy commander and is like don't you even think about going down that valley you go down that valley I got a bunch of troops laying in wait we're gonna ambush you it's not gonna be good for you I don't know why the commander would do this but um, that sort of um, posturing of being like I've got these troops I'm, I haven't deployed them to the battle yet they're not there on the field but I'm letting you know that I got them in reserve and I can call them in whenever I want to. That's kind of what assuring is. It's when someone is saying, like, I got reasons, not laying them out here, I'm not fully um, presenting them, I'm not providing you with all of the evidence, but I'm letting you know I got it uh, in case you want it. And this could be good um, in as much as, you know, maybe we need to go on that tangent, maybe we don't. Sometimes a lot of whether what would determine whether we need to go there or not 
depends on whether the other person in the discussion is concerned about those issues or is unconcerned about those issues. Like, where does the controversy lie? Um, maybe they do want to challenge that point, kind of like the burden of proof principle in the Code of Intellectual Conduct. They want to press and be like, actually, I want to see an argument for that, because I'm not so sure I buy that. I'm not sure I think that you are right to have that assumption or that premise in the argument. And then they're like, okay, well, here's what I got. And then you look at it. Um, it's a way to, to maybe move the debate along or to keep focus or direct attention in one place versus another. And sometimes that's good and very appropriate. Um, certainly when we're thinking about satisfying things like the um, relevance principle in the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I mean, with relevance, it was like, you can take tangents. Tangents can be okay, but you got to make them work for you. And if we just spend the whole time talking about tangents, we probably aren't going to be able to work on the core issue that we're here to debate or discuss uh, or to inquire into. So sometimes we have to be judicious with how we're um, spreading our attention around. And assuring can be a way to acknowledge, like, look, I got arguments. If you want to see them, I got them. You know, like students <laughs> sometimes tell me that they're like, Oh, I was sick on Tuesday, and I'm like, cool, I'll uh, I'll excuse your absence. And they're like, do you want to see a doctor's note? And I'm like, no, that's okay. They're like, okay, I got a doctor's note, though, if you want it. It's kind of like that. I haven't seen the doctor's note, but they're letting me know they have it. They haven't actually presented it. That's what assuring is. And there's a lot of ways that we do this. Um, the This one about citing authorities needs a little more discussion. Because there is something called argument from authority. And if someone just gives a full-fledged argument from authority, then they're not doing assuring. The key thing here is indicating that you've got those reasons even though you're not fully giving them or presenting them. So what uh, the book has in mind by citing authorities, and I think it's right to identify this, is when we say things like, studies have shown. You hear that a lot. You know, There's been scientific studies that have shown that proved that this is the case, that or the other thing. I mean, usually when people are bringing up scientific studies in the part of an argumentative discussion with you, they're not bringing out all the references and page numbers and presenting the studies as they were done and all the parameters of that study and why it, all the different research methods that were used to like avoid bias or blah, blah, blah. All those details are, those are really complicated and they're pretty crucial for being able to evaluate the evidential worth of that study. Studies can be done poorly. Um, and they can be done um, improperly, uh, unethically, too. Um, there can be bias that goes on this. Just because someone's wearing a white lab coat doesn't mean that they're reasoning perfectly. So we would, if we wanted to, do, to really dig in critically to evaluate that evidence for what it's worth, we'd need it to be fully presented. But usually that doesn't happen. Usually we're just sort of citing that there is a source here without really providing it and doing all the hard work of making the case of what the actual argument is. Um, even in philosophy, we sometimes do this. We'd be like, well, Kant says this, you know, or whatever. And we're not giving all of Kant's arguments, um, but we're sort of like, yeah, Kant's probably got some good reasons, but we don't know what they are, right? We're just like, there's someone here who um, has something to offer, but we're not laying it all out on the table. So that's definitely a big way that we uh, engage in assuring is by citing authorities without giving a full-fledged argument from authority. But the other way, and I'd say this is probably the most common one, um, because there's a lot of sharing going on every day in discussions that you have with people, and that is to comment on or merely express the strength of your belief. So if you are putting your claims down and you're like, boom, this is solid, you know, like, I just really think that this is true, I can't even imagine that this could be false, anything like that. Uh, sometimes just tone of voice, um, anything that emphasizes your confidence or conviction in a claim uh, is also going to um, conversationally imply backup reasons that you aren't providing. And how does that work? Well, it, it works along the principle of quality. If you remember the principle of quality from the Gricean maxims, they're saying not only don't say things that you believe to be false, but don't say things for which you lack adequate evidence. And that also goes, not maybe just for the claims that we make, but for the attitudes that we have. So if someone uh, is presenting a lot of confidence in their claim, then we presume they must have some good reason for that confidence. There must be something backing, backing it up. Now, that again, uh, you may become cynical and jaded about, and then you wouldn't have that kind of assumption perhaps or with a particular person maybe 
Um, but I think Paul Grice is onto something in thinking that this is the sort of the default that then we adjust from there. So we might be like, oh, now I don't buy into confidence at all. It's reading that someone has some good reasons. But um, you might still, I mean, even if you're cynical about whether they have good reasons, you probably might believe that they think they have reasons. <laughs> so there's something that they haven't presented that might be behind their case um, that would support it. And that would, again, be assuring. It'd be using conversational implication to indicate that you have backup reasons without actually providing them. Um, so that's what's going on there. All right, so what's good about assuring? Well, we can't always go on every single tangent all the time. So, and oftentimes we don't care. We're like, as long as there's a reasonable case for something, we're like, that's good. We don't need it to, we don't need to look at every nook and cranny. Sometimes we do. Philosophers generally want to do that, but it, not, it doesn't, it, in a, sort of a case by case example, we might care about it. I use this FDA example. Um, this might be, you might think the exact opposite on this. That they're like, actually, that's it's because of concerns about the FDA, FDA that ex are exactly why we need to take a look at the evidence. But to do this perfectly would be impossible. Okay, so assuring can can help us um, be a little efficient with our use of time in a in a discussion. But there's definitely some bad ways um, and ugly ways. So one of the uglies would definitely be this thing called abusive assurances that the book talks about. Um, and this is this is certainly a, a way. This this is another silencing mechanism. If we go back to our discussion of respect from earlier in the quarter, um, but it's it's bullying the audience by insinuating that asking for justification is wrong, usually for a reason like being stupid. But there's a lot of other ways to do it, like that asking that challenging it or, or asking for the claim to be defended with argument would be something immoral or um, sacrilegious, or arrogant, or just not respectful, uh, so many different things. Um, could So many things that we would consider to be bad could be attached to um, the, the uh, action of asking for justification. Basically, exercising the privilege that the um, burden of proof principle gives to anyone in a debate where the you know, burden of proof principle is saying it's always fair to ask someone to defend their claim. Um, that's always an okay thing to do, but abusive assurances are not respecting that. They're, um, they're trying to intimidate a person into not asking for the justification. Um, so that's, that's no good. But the other stuff that can sometimes be bad about assuring is just uh, we'll, we'll use assuring when we kind of, this is not all the time, but sometimes, uh, when we kind of run out of arguments. <laughs> when, when we don't have reasons, then we just start posturing as if we have them without actually giving them. So I say, you know, interpreting assurances as signs to go digging into a person's argument, not a bad idea. Again, you can use charity to help come up with arguments for someone. So like I say down here, use some common sense. If you can put together an argument for a claim, which someone is giving assurances for, um, that you think are uncontroversial and uncomplicated and not really, you know, it's not, it's not something that we need to debate, then maybe you don't need to call people out for it. It's not like at every moment that someone makes a claim, you should be like, hey, back it up with evidence. I'm not, I don't see you backing things up with evidence. That's wrong. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. Um, Certainly okay to use assurances to, um, you know, not have to back up at every single moment of every single claim that gets made. But when someone does use assuring, it might be because they've run out of reasons. Or kind of like, eh, it just seems right, you know, or that we start expressing more confidence that actually the less arguments we have to back something up. It's sort of weird how that works sometimes. Um, but watch out for that. That's also something to um, keep in mind about assurances. That's just about some like general advice about it. Again, the key thing that we're listening for for this annotation exercise is you're listening for someone indicating in some way, in many, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but indicating in some way that they've got some backup reasons without actually laying them out on the table and saying this because of this or this therefore that or something like that. Okay, so that's what we're looking for with assuring. Um, expressions of confidence and conviction are, that's a very common way to do it. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, next one we we'll talk about here is guarding. 
Guarding is um, happening when we weaken our claims so that they are less subject to attack. And this, this I think, is really um, important to uh, break down because this is, this is a conversational act. Notice. It's not a speech act. It's not just the speech act, which weakening our claims, that could be a speech act. Um, but weakening our claims so that they are less subject to attack, now that's bringing in an activity for a purpose or an activity with an intended effect. And that's what we were talking about as conversational acts, if you remember back to our linguistic analysis unit. Um, so guarding is more than just watching someone put little caveats into a claim that makes their claim weaker. It's when someone is doing that and you believe that the speaker is weakening the claim for the purpose of making it easier to defend that claim. Again, I got a martial metaphor here for what, what guarding is all about. Um, let's imagine that like the, the context of debate and arguments going back and forth with objections and defenses, kind of like a, like a gun battle. So you know, people are occupying different positions and then they're like shooting bullets of kind of like objections, right? Um, and one thing I could do to prevent myself from getting hit by bullets is to present a smaller target. If I'm like, huge position, it's pretty easy to object to it. There's a lot of targets to shoot. Um, but if I've got a smaller position, if I present a smaller target, then it's harder to hit me. And that's kind of how guarding works, that um, the more audacious or strong a claim is, the more open to objection it is. But you can pare that down. You can make a more modest claim, and then it's harder to object to it. So we can sometimes make modest claims just to make modest claims, though, and that wouldn't count as guarding. Guarding is specifically weakening the claim for the purpose of making it easier to defend. So there has to you have to kind of think about what does it seem like the person is up to. My best advice for um, for how to track down guarding when you're trying to have this on your radar is first. Listen for just someone weakening a claim. Like, what are those little words and phrases that make a claim weaker than they could have been otherwise? That there's like a stronger possible way of making the same basic claim. Um, and then ask yourself, would the speaker, do in my judgment, do I think the speaker would like to make the stronger claim, but just doesn't feel comfortable making the stronger claim because they think they can't defend it? You know, but so I, I ask that question. Do I think the speaker would be motivated? Is there any reason why they would want to make the stronger claim um, to see whether it's guarding? And I think that's a very, very good policy to have here when you're working through the homework problems and eventually on the exam, that that's a good way to think about it. Um, but to explain guarding here, we should probably also talk about the ways that we can make claims stronger or weaker. And there are a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, the first most noticeable one here is about scope. So the intended extent of a claim, um, not necessarily a conclusion of a claim. I'm going to put that. So you could say most all, or all to most a few, at least one. That's kind of a sequence here. Um, one really common way of guarding is to restrict, to put little conditions on what we're talking about. So, you know, it's it's different if I'm talking about all human beings always at all times and places, or just like Americans in the 21st century, or Washingtonians, or students at Bellevue College, or online students at Bellevue College, or, you know, there's um, there's a lot of ways that we can restrict the scope of our claim, the subject that we're talking about. The bigger the subject, the larger the claim. The more narrow the subject, the weaker the claim. Um, that's one big way that that happens. We can also use these modality phrases. So um, Modality uh, is actually an area of formal logic. Um, we're not going to get into that in this class, but if you take a formal logic class, you might get into modal logic. But the basic idea here is that I can take the content of a claim, and I can't by attaching a different modal operator, it can become stronger or weaker. So, for instance, um, if I say something is true, well, that's saying something that's stronger than saying that that same thing is possible. So there's possibly something, or something is actually true, or I could say something stronger than that, I could say something is necessarily true. Saying something is necessarily true is like saying it's impossible for it to be false. That's stronger than saying that it's actually true. There's a lot of things that are actually true, 
that it's possible in the sense of logical possibility, if you remember that discussion from my last video lecture, um, there's a lot of things that are actually true, but for which it is possible that it could be wrong. Like, it's true that I'm wearing a hat, but it's possible that I could not be wearing a hat. I mean, that's a that's a possibility. It's, certainly it's physically possible. Certainly logically possible. If it's physically possible, it's logically possible. Um, but in the actual world, it turns out I am wearing the hat. So it means that it's not true, that I'm not wearing the hat. But it would be possible to have been otherwise. I could have made a different decision here. I could have done something like Taken, taken it off now. I could have done that five minutes ago. You know, so um, to say something is necessarily true is to make a pretty strong claim, especially when we're, if we're talking about something like um, logical possibility. But sometimes we can say those things, like the concept of validity from last time is making a necessary a claim about necessity. Um, if the argument is valid, then it's saying it's actually logically impossible to have the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time. So um, we can make those those necessity claims as well. We just don't do it very often. Uh, we make a lot more claims about what's actually true, and then from there we it can go weaker. Um, between um, actually true and uh, pro uh, and possibly true, we might also throw in there the phrase probably true, and that can have a whole range of strength that's going on with it based on the level of probability. Um, but the higher the 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 um, or the more plausible something is, or more probable it is, the stronger that claim is going to be too. So we can throw those sorts of phrases into the mix um, to make a claim weaker and stronger. We can also change our level of commitment to a claim. So, and this is kind of thinking about um, something that philosophers call assertability, which is not always the same thing as like knowledge or rational justification, but it's kind of similar to rational justification. Assertability is like, is it reasonable to assert a claim? And for asserting that you know something, you need a lot of evidence in order to be able to claim knowledge about something. But for it to be reasonable to say that you believe it, that requires less. But it still maybe requires more than something like a suspicion. A suspicion requires a very low amount of evidence in order to be, for you to be rationally justified in suspecting something does not require a lot of evidence. To be rationally justified in believing something requires more, and to claim knowledge about it is even stronger than that. So um, this would be more about uh, what sort of behavior, um, uh, the other fancy philosophy word for this is doxastic. I can spell it for you here. These doxastic attitudes are the attitudes that we have about certain possible beliefs. Um, and these are these get uh, perpetually stronger, more in the direction of knowledge. But this is about what it would be, which which doxastic attitudes are reasonable to have, and some of them would require more evidence versus less. So that's another thing about weakening our claims; so they're less subject to attack. Um, if it, if I need more to defend myself, then it's easier to object to. So this is another way that that happens. I'd say the scope thing is probably the biggest one, followed by this, and then maybe this one's a runner-up to that in terms of like what you should have on your radar that you're like listening for. Um, but anything where it feels like the speaker is making some modification to their claim or putting a caveat in that if they didn't put that in the claim would be stronger or that there's a stronger version of the claim that's being made, that's what you should listen for. Uh, and then when you're like, okay, there is a stronger version of the claim that has been made um, that they could have made instead, then ask yourself, would they want to make the stronger claim? And if the answer to that is yes, then guarding is a reasonable interpretation of what's taking place. If the answer is that they don't want to make the stronger claim, then probably not guarding. Um, so that's what guarding is. What is good about this? Well, um, guarding, uh, this is something, uh, like I say here, the book doesn't necessarily discuss this as much as I wish they did. But we, we should talk about guarding premises and guarding conclusions. What's really good about guarding premises is that if I've got an argument, I've got conclusion, got some premises backing it up, I don't need to go overboard. Americans have this, I've noticed, have this tendency that when they argue, they like to make much stronger claims in their premises than are really needed to justify their conclusion. And I think a lot of that is to like uh, demonstrate confidence and conviction in their position. They're like, I'm going to claim more than I need to. 
because I'm so confident that this is right. Um, but that, but that's an important skill is recognizing how much evidence do I really need to justify this conclusion and not claiming more than you need to. Guarding premises is, is a Goldilocks problem here. Um, the, the stronger your claims, the more open to objection they are. So we want to make them weaker. But if you make them too weak, then they aren't strong enough to provide a good support relation for the truth of the conclusion. We need something more backing it up in order to justify the conclusion. So um, that's the kind of balancing act that you're playing when you're talking about to guard or not to guard with premises. When is it good? When is it bad? Um, it's good in as much as you, we're, we're trying to get it just right. We want just the right amount of evidence to be able to back up the conclusion. We don't need to go overboard on it. Um, that uh, that it kind of misrepresents the rational situation anyway. If we did, even if we can, it'd be like, why not do it if you can? I'd be like, maybe, but it might be cool to know just how little could we get away with and still have a good argument for this conclusion if someone was skeptical um, or pre started presenting some good skeptical arguments, even if we can't imagine them right now. Um, you know, how much do we need to hang on to in order for the argument to succeed? In order for there to be a good support relation from the premises to the conclusion. You might notice that there's something going on here. Um, remember I said in the last lecture, very important lecture, that there are two standards for having a good argument. That are really the same no matter what argument we're talking about or what situation or context or anything. Premises need to be true. And they need to have they need to provide a good support relation for the conclusion's truth. Right? The the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, the truth there needs to be a good support relation. So both things are required. Guarding your premises is a way to try to do a better job of meeting that first standard of having all true premises. But if you guard your claims too much, if you're too wishy-washy with your premises by weakening them, watering them down so much, now you're going to start to run into trouble with the second standard of being able to have a good support relation. And there's this between a rock and a hard place that a lot of arguments can get into. And I've seen this happen countless times in philosophy where there's, there's kind of no good way to save the argument. Um, you might, you, in order to have a good support relation, you need the claims to be stronger. But when you make them stronger, then they become obviously false. Uh, and they, so there can be this weird trade-off there. Um, I'm going to come back to that situation in a second to talk about some abusive use of guarding. But let's talk now about guarding conclusions. Guarding conclusions is a more subtle art than guarding premises. Why? Well, because when you're guarding premises, you're kind of you get the conclusion as a way to sort of set how strong your premises need to be. The stronger the conclusion, the more evidence you need to back it up. Um, but so if you've got a weak conclusion, you can get away with some pretty weak premises. So you can guard your premises a lot, and that'll be okay. You'll still be able to have a good argument. But if you have a really strong conclusion, then you're like, oh, I can't get away with a lot of guarding on the premises because I need strong premises to provide enough evidence for that conclusion. So, but you're you're kind of you're catching that Goldilocks moment right based on the strength of the conclusion. The conclusion is sort of your beacon or your guide here for how strong your, pre your premises need to be and what you can get away with. When it comes to guarding conclusions or not, there isn't, so, there isn't this useful guide. And I, I think this is another uh, type of art, and I don't think the book talks about this as mu very much at all. Um, but it, it's like if, um, if you were... Like when you start writing your own philosophy papers, your own original philosophical work, and you're like, what needs to be said? What needs to be talked about? What issues do I want to resolve here? Um, it can be hard to figure out how much to bite off uh, in a paper. Like how strong of a conclusion do I want? How much strong of a conclusion matters? So I could, I could defend a stronger conclusion or a weaker conclusion. Which one really do I does do I need the stronger conclusion? Why? I mean, the context for what kind of conclusions we want to defend is much more amorphous, uh, much more abstract, and and harder to sort out. But that's an, another kind of skill I think is knowing, um, you know, when under what circumstances do we need the stronger conclusion or the weaker one? One thing that helps is just having a better knowledge of that area of inquiry. Um, when I have explored some area of philosophy that I'm unfamiliar with or some area of science or something like that, uh, it takes me a while before I kind of see what's going on and see what might be needed. Um, where are the controversies? Um, how strong, if this claim is too weak, if I'm defending this conclusion and it's too weak, 
then it's not really going to make a difference. It's not going to affect any of the things that we're disagreeing about or concerned about or answering any of the questions that we have. Um, but maybe in some cases there are some very strong claims, some really um, ambitious claims to knowledge that we don't really need or that if we're like we don't get that kind of knowledge we're like okay kind of weren't hoping for it anyway or something like there might be a certain level of strength that's that's more than we need there too so picking your conclusion just right like how to define a thesis for a paper where you get the scope just right you get the strength just right um, is its own special art form that doesn't have as clear cut of a guide. So I like to mention that. Um, I think that's a cool thing to have on the radar here when talking about guarding. Okay, let's go back to the abusive part thing here. And this is, um, so going back to when we were talking about guarding premises and being between this rock and a hard place on uh, being able to satisfy both standards for a good argument, having true premises, but still having a good support relation, a strong enough support relation to defend the conclusion. Um, like I was saying, sometimes an argument can get into a situation where uh, it can't. It doesn't seem like it can have it both ways. Like they need it needs to have the stronger premises in order to have a good support relation. But when you make them that strong, then they're easily subject to objection. So you can't necessarily have it both ways. Well, sometimes someone who's making such an argument might do a kind of bait and switch thing, where when they're talking about defending the premises as true and responding to those kinds of, ob of objections, then they use the arguments in their guarded version. But when they're responding to concerns about whether they've got strong enough evidence to justify the conclusion, whether they have a good support relation, um, then they use the claims in their unguarded versions. So there's kind of a swapping here, depending on which type of objection we're trying to answer, you're actually making different claims. Because the guarded and unguarded versions of claim are not equivalent. They might have the same idea, but they're subject to very different um, standards when it comes to their rational evaluation. One of them is much easier to defend than the other. Um, the guarded versions are easier to defend than the unguarded versions. But you kind of you kind of got to watch out for this. Sometimes people do this um, as a kind of confidence trick, almost like politicians will do this, or they'll they'll kind of. We're kind of like the what the Plato always used to complain about the sophists in ancient Greece. They'd be like they're they're manipulating language in an inappropriate way. Um, they're making it look like one thing when it's really not that thing um, by using the same claim or treating a claim as if it's the same when it's really not in order to try to make it look like they've got a good case when they really don't. They might the argument might be screwed. It might not be capable of being saved one way or the other. They're they're going to run into an objection either way. Um, but the other thing I like to say, so it can, it can certainly be abusive if that's being done intentionally. If, it, if you're intentionally trying to mislead people this way, then that, that's a problem. That's an abusive use of this guarding maneuver. Um, but there's a bad, the, the same thing can happen, and it would just be bad, and I, I wouldn't call it abusive. In a, it wouldn't be, it would just be the bad, it wouldn't be the ugly. In as much as we can make this mistake innocently. I've seen a lot of... Um, philosophy books that where I'm like I think this thing is happening in this book but I don't think that the author is specifically trying to deceive or mislead me um, it's just sometimes hard to stay consistent um, and like I said these these two different standards for good argument they're evaluated completely differently one of them is thinking about what's actually true the other one's thinking about what's possibly true they require a totally different mindset for figuring out whether all the premises are true or there's a good support relation so it makes sense that we're kind of there's a there's a splitting of the mind that can happen, or we can forget that like oh yeah, ah dang it I I had to guard the claims in order to defend against the possibility of those objections, um, so now I can't use them in their unguarded sense over here. They're and they're going to be too weak. We might not make that connection. Uh, you know, one chapter of the book might talk about the claim in one sense, and then they use it in a different sense in another chapter of the book. So. This is why it's always important to be a critical reader, an active critical reader, when you're looking at these arguments. Make sure that the person is staying consistent with their use of their claims. Um, because they can look really similar. They can have the same thematic and conceptual content, but without those little adjustments, those little guarding caveats that are thrown in there, you got a very different claim. Okay, so watch out for that. That's guarding. Let's talk about discounting. Discounting we're going to define here as anticipating criticisms and then dismissing them. 
And right off the bat, you might be like, this counting is terrible. This is like violating the fallibility principle in the Code of Intellectual Conduct, or the rebuttal principle. I mean, they're both kind of relevant here. Um, just dismissing your critics. I thought we were trying to be charitable to them. I thought we were trying to understand them and give them an appropriate response. And that is true. That is very true. And the appropriate uses of discounting don't make that kind of mistake. Okay, that, That's the first thing to note here. There is a time and a place to dismiss objections with, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not taking them seriously. But it's a maneuver that can be made. Um, let, let's actually... I want to talk right away here about how it could be good. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's let's skip here. I'll come back to it in a second. But um, you could be going through an argument. You're trying to d defend your position, um, but you're as you're laying it out there, you're like someone might object to me here, but I don't think that that's right, and you move on. You don't actually deal with the objection at the moment. And doing that, you might do because you're trying to get your idea out there. Have you ever had that experience where um, you're trying to explain your perspective and someone's jumping in with objections like every other breath? And you're like, hold off, buddy. Like, let me get my idea out here, and then we can listen to your objections. Like, <laughs> Listen first, then evaluate what I'm saying. Um, the, that we can do even without the person sort of jumping in and being obnoxious. We could, we could be like... There is an objection here, I've heard, but I don't think it's really effective, so... And then here's the other, here's the next part of my theory. And you're just kind of laying it all out. By dismissing it at that moment, it's not like you're saying, I'm never willing to talk about this ever again. That you're like dogmatic and unwilling to engage with criticism. It might just be that you're like, not right now. In fact, if you identify that there's a possibility of a criticism and then discount it, uh, at the very least, you're doing something way more in terms of charity here by at least indicating that it's possible for someone to object to something that you're saying. It's like acknowledging where there's maybe a controversial or weak spot in your argument or your position. Um, that's pretty awesome to do that. Even if you're discounting it, you haven't given an argument against it, by even just putting some weapons in your opponent's hands, that's exactly consistent with what this sort of vision that we get from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. So I like to emphasize that right out of the gates here. Um, discounting can sound like you're, and it's not dismissing people. <laughs> like that would be that would be a bad and abusive version of discounting. Those are, I think are easy to spot. What are the what's the bad and the ugly here at discounting? It's easy to spot. It's when dismissing criticism actually is violating the spirit of something like the fallibility principle which I was arguing, whether you're open-minded or closed-minded, is really a matter of your willingness to engage with objections and criticism. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're being dogmatic and closed-minded. And that's that's not helpful or conducive to truth-seeking, and it's not usually being respectful to your conversational uh, partner, uh, whoever you're talking to, um, or to even your unseen opponents who are not, <laughs> not even in the room. Um, not good to do that. But there are some good versions of discounting. Let, let's let's talk. Let's go go back though. Let's wind back the clock a little bit here and talk about how how we actually do it. So how does discounting happen? Well, there's a bunch of words that we can use that links claim that link claim together. A link claims together um, in a way that gives priority over the other. Uh, my favorite example from the book is is uh, or my favorite examples are from the book. They're the the two. Do you remember these um, when you're doing the reading? The ring is expensive but beautiful. Or, the ring is beautiful, but expensive. Like, both of them are actually making the same claims. The ring is beautiful, the ring is expensive. But that but word in there, and but is a very, very common discounting word, um, or although, or however, or words like that, all of those words indicate that there's sort of a priority here of one or the other. If I say, the ring is expensive, but beautiful, I'm acknowledging, I mean, there's a lot of conversational implication that's going on here, actually. We can we can dig a lot out of that one simple sentence. But what we already sort of get here Im through implication is that um, the person believes that the ring should be bought because it's beautiful. But they're aware of the objection that the ring should not be bought because it's expensive. So they're acknowledging the objection, the ring is expensive, but it's beautiful. And that's more important. So that objection gets kind of dismissed. Um, discounting is actually very, very similar to assuring, in as much as um, dismissing an objection is different from responding to an objection. So, 
no argument is given here for why beauty should trump expensiveness or vice versa if it's the other example. Um, and that so that means that there's not really an argument being made that's being given as a response to the objection. If that was happening, you wouldn't be dismissing the objection, you'd just be replying to it. So that wouldn't be discounting. Discounting is dismissing the objection without argument. And that's what makes it like assuring. Because assuring was like saying, I got arguments, but I'm not giving them right now. Okay? Um, so that, that's an important thing to be listening for in terms of listening, uh, for the phenomenon of discounting. Um, listen to calibrate your ear for the person acknowledging that there is room for objection or disagreement or controversy, but is pushing it off to one side without giving reasons or argument for it. That would be discounting. Um, that's how we do that. Um, there's kind of two ways that this can happen, and um, as I talk about here in my lecture notes, and these two ways are perfectly symmetrical with the two ways in which arguments could be could be good or bad. Um, having all true premises, having a good support relation. Um, one one thing I always love to say is that objections never come from nowhere. Um, sometimes I think there's this conceit that we have that um, we can criticize other perspectives without adopting any positive perspective of our own, like criticizing ideologies while being like, well, I don't have any ideologies. I'm just critical of all these other ideologies. Every objection, every criticism requires some positive position that you have to stand for in order to be able to launch the objection. There's always, there's always some logic or reason or evidence or argument that's behind every single objection. Um, even if it's just something as simple as the principle of non-contradiction. If your objection to someone's perspective is that it's contradicting itself, you're still committing yourself positively to logic. <laughs> and that might be a small commitment, but it, it's still a commitment. Okay. Um, so if someone makes an objection and you want to criticize the objection, there is a positive argument that the objection is making. Think of an objection as basically an argument that just says the conclusion is, is false. And they have to present some reasons and whatever is the content of the objection or the premises for that is the conclusion. And you can object to an objection by saying that the objection either has false premises, so the complaint that's being leveraged is just not true, or you can say that um, it has a bad support relation. You could say, I agree with what you're saying. That, so there's an objection coming to your position and being like, you're right, that's what my position is doing. But I don't think that that's a fatal objection. I don't think that that defeats my position. I agree with you. That, that's, that's something you're offering as a reason for why my position is wrong. I don't think that that follows. All right? I'm attacking the support relation of that objection. Um, so those are the two ways that we could discount. Uh, without, and this could happen even without giving the full argument. I could be like, just be like, well, that's false. No reason why I think it's false. Nothing backing up that claim. Just that objection is false. Boom. That's discounting. We could discount that way. Or we could be like, yeah, if that was true, that would be, or um, I agree that that's true, but it's not a problem for my position. And I don't defend why, but I'm just like, I'm not worried about that. It's just a flesh wound, <laughs> something like that. That objection doesn't, is not a fatal one. Um, so again, without argument, defending the rejection of the objection, that's going to be discounting. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so those, um, I think... Uh, let's see, we're at 48 minutes. I don't think I'm going to get quite into evaluative language. I'll, I'll, we'll have a follow-up lecture that's going to be a little shorter, probably not quite as long. Um, but I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to push it right now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I want to, before we do that, I actually want to look at this exercise and uh, that's on the homework. Um, I'm kind of cheating a little bit by giving you this early, but I want to do it. If I gave you a few homework answers, I'm not going to sweat it too much here. But I want to give you a picture of kind of what we're ultimately doing in this unit, in this module. Um, I, I mentioned that exercise seven, and actually here I can pull it, pull this up. Um, critical reasoning, homework here, scan. So here's the PDF of the exercises that um, I assigned from this chapter. And I said that exercises, um, ugh, here, here we go, let's make that a little bigger. I said that exercise seven, this one right here, and especially this exercise three from chapter four, 
these ones are really important and crucial um, because they're the closest thing to what I'm going to be asking you to do on the exam. Uh, the only difference is going to be I'm not going to give you the numbers. So I would just give you like a, a paragraph, like not quite this long, um, but two shorter paragraphs, um, and then ask you to annotate for all these different things that we're looking for. Argument markers, assuring guarding discounting, and evaluative terms. Um, and right now we haven't talked about evaluative terms yet, but we have talked about argument markers and assuring guarding and discounting. So um, let's look at that. Here, here are some simpler cases, but imagine that, um, so I'm going to use Microsoft Paint here. <laughs> imagine that there were no, um, oh, come on. Man, it's so low tech, but hopefully you get the idea. You know, imagine the numbers here were gone and you just had the text. And so you're having to listen for all these different things that I'm asking you to listen, be listening for. But how would you proceed here? You would do something like this. You might circle the thing, you know, the text will be there on the exam, and I'd just have you circle it, and then you'll label which thing you think it is. So um, in this case, let's, let's look at this example. Although no mechanism has been discovered, most researchers in the field agree that smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease. Although no mechanism has been discovered, if we just are listening to this, again, without really attaching to the language and doing this mechanically, just turn on your listening ears, and you're listening for these different dynamics that we've been talking about in these video lectures, um, and that the book's been talking about. What is happening here? I mean, by saying, although no mechanism has been discovered, even without looking at the specific word although, or having that called to your attention, you have to be able to pick up here that the person is acknowledging that there's some controversy here, that there's some potential objection that they're kind of defending this idea that smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease based on what most researchers in the field agree about regarding that issue. Um, but they acknowledge that no mechanism has been discovered. And if there was no mechanism, that'd be a reason to maybe not think that smoking greatly increases the chance of heart disease. This is an objection. We can, we can hear the controversy that's taking place here. And how are they dealing with that controversy? Well, they're discounting it. And the language of although is how they're actually doing that. So we're, we're kind of listening for these things. Um, and it's not like you're going to know to look put this attention on although. But once you're recognizing that there's, like, there's some discounting going on here, that they're acknowledging an objection and they're kind of dismissing it. Notice there's no response to this. They're just acknowledging it and saying it doesn't matter. Um, then go looking for the language in the sentence that's responsible for making that move. And although is really the word that's doing it here. It's saying, I acknowledge that, but it doesn't matter. And that's that's discounting. So you if, you, if this was on the exam, you'd circle that, put the D there to indicate discounting, done. Same thing as we go here further. So um, most is going to be something. So in this exercise, they are calling attention. But what else are we listening for here? Um, most researchers in the field agree that smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease. Um, most kind of, this could be stronger. It could be all. But they said most instead of all. Would they want to say all? Would they love to say that all researchers in the field agree? I mean, that would be a better thing for their case. But maybe claiming all is a bridge too far. Maybe that's something more than what they can actually defend. So they're going to say most because that's going to be easier to defend. So it seems reasonable to think that this is guarding. Most makes the claim weaker than all. So there is a stronger version of the claim that could have been made instead. And it does seem reasonable to think that the speaker would love to make the stronger claim if they could. But they maybe just don't feel comfortable they can defend that. Also, this part about researchers in the field agree is an appeal to authority. And we don't know which researchers. We don't know exactly what they've said. We're just being asked to kind of take their word for it. So this itself is going to be assuring Citing authorities without really making a full-fledged argument from authority is what assuring is all about. So there we go. And what about this part here? Greatly increases the chances of heart disease. This will also be another example of guarding because it weakens the claim. There is a stronger version of it. And this is why you can't really do it always mechanically. Sometimes um, it's not just a list of words like most all. That's You, know, you can memorize that. But what about this situation? This is a little more idiosyncratic, but it's definitely the phenomenon of guarding. Because saying smoking greatly increases the chances of heart disease is definitely a weaker version of some what could be a stronger claim. 
Like maybe just something as simple as smoking causes heart disease. Boom, that would be stronger. Or smoking guarantees that you will get heart disease. Um, maybe that is the claim that the speaker would rather make. They want to certainly. We've been trying to figure out what we'd we'd like to be able to find the evidence. It seems like there is a causal connection between smoking and heart disease, but being able to prove that sometimes is difficult. So maybe we make this weaker claim. It just greatly increases the chances. It's not a guarantee, but um, it it does make things more risky. Maybe we can at least say that. Maybe we can at least defend that. Um, so this is this is a case of guarding. It's a weaker version of the, a stronger claim, and it seems like it'd be reasonable to expect that the speaker would like to make the stronger claim. So we'll count that as guarding. So this is what it'll kind of look like. You'll you'll get these passages on the exam, and you'll have to circle and annotate things. You'll you'll put these annotation marks on there, and I'll give you a list of that as a reminder too when the exam happens. Um, and uh, you might be wondering how that's going to work online, but I'm going to find a solution for this. Um, uh, a way of doing it. But you'll have to pick out, the big thing that I do want to have happen on the exam is I want you to have to pick it out for yourself and not just rely on me pointing attention. Keep in mind too, just even with this exam, uh, these um, these uh, homework problems, that it is always possible to say that it's none, right? So it's not like just because they called it out that there's something to there. Um, but we can talk about more about these uh, particular homework problems and and calibrate your listening ear here for guarding, assuring, and discounting in the study sessions. I hope to see you there. Uh, still pretty thin in terms of attendance, um, but I want to encourage you to uh, consider coming to that. I, I do think that there's um, there's a lot of calibration here. I think you um, probably want to double check on on these answers, and you will you know you get homework answers from me, but um, you, you really want to be able to. Uh, mastery of this material is not just getting the right answer. Um, so much of this is about judgment calls and also being able to understand what is behind your judgment. Being able to explain the reasoning, the logic that is behind that. So if you're like, I'm, I'm getting the right answers, but I don't know if I can explain why I'm getting the right answers. Or I don't know exactly why that was the right answer, but maybe I just made a good intuitive guess. Then you're not there at the level of mastery. and. Um, you you might struggle with the exam too, despite that. A lot of these homework exercises are a little like giving you things more like a layup, and I'm going to give things that are a little little more like real life circumstances of things you'd actually encounter on the exam. So it's always good to to check in with me about it and check in about your reasoning and how you're doing things. Uh, I always have students in this class who come up with sort of techniques, study tips and tricks for themselves, shortcuts, if you will for how to do this work. Um, and I, uh, I usually like to just say, you know, if there's a shortcut that I'm aware of after teaching this class so many times, I probably would have told you about it. Um, but you can maybe come up with something I haven't thought of before, but I always recommend double check with me. If you've got a technique that you're using that isn't something that was in the book or the lectures and you're thinking it's working, may might want to check in with me and the study sessions might be a good way to do that. So. Uh, I encourage you to do that. But I'm here. I'm always here. You can text. You can call. You don't have to wait for the study session to happen to reach out to me and get some extra help or to check in about things. If that time's not working, I'd like to know about that. Um, but yeah, please be in. Please be in touch with how things are going in the class, um, and um, I want to make sure everything's working well. So, uh, one more short lecture we're going to have for this unit, um, and then we'll be done with this module. Uh, so the next one should not be an hour long. And probably it'll be a little quicker. Probably 20 minutes. That's what I'm thinking right now. But I'll see you then next time.